Great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Symposium 5. I'm Gary Wong chairing this session uh, the, uh, entitled Microbiome and Allergy. And uh, the title of this talk is HMO Probiotics and Allergy Prevention. What is their link? And the speaker needs very little introduction. He has been to our meeting into Hong Kong many times in the past. It's Dr. Ralph Hine, and uh, he has a very special background that he's fully trained both in allergy and gastroenterology so that uh, he's capable of delivering a message in particular related to allergy, especially with uh, in the uh, gastrointestinal type of allergy. And uh, his clinical work and research interests have focused primarily on aspects of prevention and as we expected, gastrointestinal food allergy, food intolerance, eosinophilic gas, uh, gastrointestinal disorder. And uh, he was working for a long time in uh, Melbourne, uh, the epic center of the world in terms of food allergy. And, and since 2017, he has joined Nestle Health Science as a global medical director in pediatric care and is currently based in Switzerland and organizing and uh, taking the lead in a variety of clinical trials in terms of allergy prevention. So without further ado, Ralph, it's all yours. Yes. Thank you, Gary, for your yeah. kind introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to be back in Hong Kong, at least virtually, and to present at this um, annual meeting of the Hong Kong Institute of Allergy. As Professor Wong has said, I'm going to present a summary on HMOs, so human, human milk oligosaccharides, probiotics, and their context in allergy prevention. We are in the middle of an allergy epidemic, as you all know, and um, in aller allergic diseases in aller uh, adults and children have now become the most prevalent inflammatory disorder worldwide. And this happens at our barrier sites, so food and environmental allergens interact with the body's barrier site, the skin, the gastrointestinal tract and the airways. And this is more than genetic factors influenced by lifestyle changes over the past decade, which have really resulted in a reduced exposure to a diverse microbial environment. And while we now understand many of these pathways, uh, even at the molecular level, we're still struggling to find preventive, uh, effective prevention strategies at the population level. This is a very nice cartoon from a, a review article, uh, which is fairly recent, which shows you the two different pathways and um, how the gut microbiome affects tolerance or um, it deviates towards allergy. And you see on the left panel, that there is a nice delineation, a nice separation of the gut microbiome, food allergens, and um, the lamina propria and the epithelium is protected by a mucus layer pro produced by goblet cells. And you can see that um, in the lamina propria, there is a, a nice orderly control by the regulatory T lymphocytes, which suppress any unwanted inflammatory response. But on the right panel, you can see if there is dysbiosis and if bacteria start damaging epithelial um, uh, cells or maybe uh, start stressing epithelial cells and if the mucus layer is impaired, then you see that um, there is um, uh, a stress response, an alarm and response that is sent out by epithelial cells, um, interleukin 25 and interleukin um, 33 and TSLP and uh, get uh, activated. And we see the cascading down to um, Th2 effector cells that then uh, can uh, mediate an allergic response. At the heart of the allergic march or the um, uh, allergy epidemic that we see is reduced microbial immune crosstalk. So our immune system is not primed up accordingly um, the, the, uh, or, um, the, the best uh, microbiome that is possible. And that is mainly due to um, interactions uh, during the first three years of life, or maybe even earlier, in the f predominantly in the first year where the in microbiome development is highly vulnerable to environmental factors. And um, due to a more hygienic environment, um, uh, urban living, 
we, we are not exposed to the diverse in the microbial environment that we, for example, would encounter in a farm environment. And this has related, uh, resulted in a generational loss of gut microbial diversity that is passed on from uh, generation to generation. And this is in a back, on a background of reduced breastfeeding, higher rate, or rising rates of surgical deliveries, and of course, widespread antibiotic use. And I think this has to be seen in the context of any microbiome modifying intervention that the backbone of um, prevention needs to be addressing these three points. So we have multiple opportunities here for uh, microbiome modifying prevention strategies. But the landscape is complex. And as you can, if you can see here on a um, cartoon from uh, Susan Prescott uh, a few years back, you can see that, uh, that there are multiple um, influences that, that uh, influence uh, fetal programming during pregnancy. And um, the, the main one might be um, maternal diet that we can easily modify other than maybe tobacco smoking. But uh, if mothers reach, uh, eat a diet high in fruit and vegetable fiber, uh, which is in a way a prebiotic um, environment, they might take probiotics, vitamin D and um, fish. All of those things might uh, be ways how to reduce uh, the, um, the, the tendency to have an allergic um, a disease uh, later on. So, so what um, interventions in pregnancy really do is they shift your risk of a predisposition to allergy, but um, uh, it's, it's at this stage very multifactorial and hard to influence. So the, the second window is really uh, influencing the early development of the gut microbiome. And, and this starts um, with the maternal gut, gut microbiome during pregnancy and microbiome modifying strategies there like uh, probiotics. And then the inoculum that the baby gets at birth is, is very important and obviously disturbed during um, cesarean section or after cesarean section. But what we want to see is in the first year in the healthy breastfed infant that there will be an environment high in bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, valvanella. Uh, these are the predominant genera that, um, that indicate healthy microbiome. And later on, we see Bacteroides and Clostridialis uh, appear. In this developmental phase, everything is very, uh, um, very vulnerable to, to um, environmental uh, influences and antibiotics, of course. In the second year, we still are in a transitional phase towards a more stable environment. And we see here that diet and environment uh, play a big role and uh, overall diversity increases. And in the third year of life, from about 30 months onwards, uh, we see uh, an almost stable adult microbiome, um, which uh, is very hard to shift. So, so our prevention period really is the first thousand days of life where it starts during the pregnancy with the maternal gut microbiome. And then uh, towards the end of the second year, um, the window is slowly closing. And here, just a reminder of the effects of cesarean section. And you can see um, that uh, when, uh, so this, this is um, really showing you a cartoon, not limited to allergies, but other uh, non-communicable diseases, NCDs, follow the same path as allergy and, and cesarean section therefore is a precursor, not just to allergic disease, eczema, asthma, but also perhaps to type 1 diabetes, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease and cardiovascular risk. So let's have a quick look at the early determinants of the microbiome development. And this is taken from the Teddy study, which was a, a large birth cohort study looking at the microbiome effect, uh, early microbiome development and uh, subsequent risk of type 1 diabetes. And this is a very nice and interesting paper which looks at the um, modifiers of the early gut microbiome. And you can see highlighted on the left side, maternal BMI, birth mode, breastfeeding, um, not surprisingly are important modifiers that there are also some environmental modifiers and, and uh, at the bottom you see antibiotics probably emerging more towards the um, second year of life. But you can see the, the, the large bars there for, for breast milk which highlight the importance of breast milk and HMO in shaping the early microbiome. So uh, this is another um, nice um, birth cohort paper that uh, came out a few years ago, looking at 
the, the risk of asthma and wheezing in, uh, in relationship to the microbiome. And it's, it's a Canadian study that was um, based on the Canadian child study in uh, 300 infants who were um, recruited according to three groups, a uh, healthy control group, a group with HOP and a group with um, wheeze by 12 months of age. And, and there were significant gut microbiome differences already at three months of age, which uh, uh, shows us that the uh, very early microbiome development over the first 100 days after birth may already shape uh, allergic risk. And um, what they could show is that four genera, Bellinella, Lachnospira, Rothia, and Fecalibacterium were significantly decreased in babies who were subsequently going to develop asthma. And um, uh, th this is very important, um, uh, which highlights uh, that very early on we have already um, uh, the, um, the, the risk being modified. And you can see that this is also translated into a lower rate, uh, lower levels of fecal acetate, which is um, generally um, high in a high bifido um, environment. So, so again, showing that there is dysbiosis. And what they could also show, and I can't, don't have time to go into all the details, but when they um, did a, an experiment with inoculation of germ-free mice with the fecal microbiome of one of these uh, infants with a high atopic risk, they could um, show that these mice developed inflammation in the lung and by replenishing the um, microbiome of these mice with those four missing genera, ameliorated um, lung inflammation. So this shows um, that, that there might even be um, new probiotics on the horizon that are outside the typical bifidobacteria and uh, lactobacilli. So, so a new um, generation, if you like, of probiotics might be emerging. This is a, a slightly hard to read slide, but what I wanted to show you is that the allergy prevention uh, landscape is slowly changing. And this is, um, I've taken um, the American Academy of Pediatrics as one of the examples, but similar trends will probably be observed for, for many of the um, scientific um, societies. And you can see in the top, uh, boxes that breastfeeding remains the top pillar of allergy prevention, although it's not perfect, but it shows that um, breastfeeding for at least three to six months will reduce the risk of um, atopic disease and asthma. And um, you, um, the, the only thing that has changed that there is now a stronger messaging around the prevention of uh, wheezing in the first two years of life. You can also see at the bottom of the uh, chart that there is evidence now for early allergen introduction and this is spelled out more specifically now for infant safe forms of peanut to be introduced early as part of complementary feeding and this is a stronger wording than in the previous um, guideline from 2008. And you can also see one thing um, that I wanted to comment on a little bit further which is the shift uh, away from uh, the the uh, recommendation of a partially hydrolyzed formula in allergy prevention. And this is largely based on a meta-analysis that came out in the British Medical Journal in 2016, showing that um, uh, partially and extensively hydrolyzed formulas don't seem to have a clear effect on, al uh, on allergy prevention uh, in children under four years of age. And this uh, was framed a little bit differently to previously because it summarizes um, eczema risk in this case uh, in children under four years and, and not by age bracket. So this, this um, sent a message that um, partially hydrolyzed formula was um, maybe not as useful as previously thought. But interestingly, when you just look at uh, one sort of um, hydrolyzed formula, um, we uh, which has been used, for example, also in the Gini study, which uh, many of you will know. Um, you could see that there are different age windows and this um, um, uh, meta-analysis that came out by Hanya Shelkevska uh, in the World Allergy Organization Journal in uh, the following year showed that there are still windows um, beyond the early childhood where asthma may be prevented. And um, I think um, limiting the analysis to specific um, uh, PHF products May, may provide a clearer picture. But the combination of allergy pre prevention strategies remains quite a um, diverse um, mix of approaches. And I think we have to um, 
evaluate these in the context of each other as combination interventions. So we have during pregnancy mainly the approach of um, probiotics and maybe um, high um, DHA, EPA supplemented um, foods or a high fish diet uh, to, to modulate maternal immune um, responses and the maternal microbiome. Um, after birth, then of course, um, breastfeeding is the main uh, pillar. If breastfeeding is not possible, um, whey-based uh, partially hybridized formula may still have a role. And uh, I think the recent supplementation with HMOs there may have uh, increased that role again. But we also have new approaches uh, dealing with eczema directly and maintaining intact skin barrier and maybe treating eczema proactively as a, because it is a known precursor to food allergy. So what are the interventions? So I've mentioned already the changes in perinatal practice that really need to avoid C-sections, uh, promote breastfeeding and reduce antibiotic use. Um, this is all part of good clinical practice. But um, we have dietary supplements really uh, extending now from probiotics, HMOs, lactose, prebiotics, and um, more recently postbiotics and butyrate. And there are some um, experimental approaches which are still being evaluated, like um, uh, C-section babies being uh, uh, what's called vaginal seeding. So they're being swabbed with the birth canal microbiome of the mother after birth. Or um, as I already mentioned, certain microbial consortia may also have a role, but they are uh, currently on, under evaluation. So just um, a few words of, uh, to probiotics, um, because probiotics are a confusing field. We've seen numerous RCTs with a range of different probiotics, and I think they all had slightly different outcomes, are slightly different in design and not that easy to compare. But um, what we generally could say is that, um, uh, that there is still support for probiotics, uh, but it is not for all allergic disease, but it is, seems to be mainly uh, for the risk of eczema. And I, I'll show you um, studies to that effect. Um, but that does not be a, the, uh, appear to be the same benefit for other allergic diseases. And this is based on a, um, a meta-analysis again from five years ago, um, published in, uh, in, in JACI, the Journal of Allergy, uh, Cl uh, Clinical Allergy and Immunology. And what they uh, found is that for, for eczema prevention, um, use of probiotics during pregnancy, breastfeeding and directly to the infant still provided a risk reduction for eczema, but not for the other diseases with the drawback that quality of evidence was um, not as high as it perhaps should be. And that there was no data provided for specific probiotics. In the following year, there, or a couple of years later, um, there was another meta-analysis looking at LGG, which is what probably the most preeminent or the most widely studied uh, probiotic uh, in allergy prevention. And Hanya Shayevska's group again uh, showed that the evidence for LGG is probably not as clear as uh, one might like, or as we have previously thought, because in her meta-analysis, she could really not show that uh, LGG was effective in preventing uh, eczema when used in isolation. What about prebiotics? There's not much data on prebiotics uh, dedicated to allergy prevention. There's this one trial that I found, uh, which is now 10 years old, where a prebiotic mix uh, of um, long chain uh, galacto oligosaccharides, short chain uh, fructo oligosaccharides, and pectin-like acidic oligosaccharides was um, trialed against unsupplemented cow's milk formula and compared to breastfeeding infants. And what the study sh could show that the prebiotic supplemented uh, cow's milk-based formula had a preventive effect for eczema uh, by about 40% risk reduction or uh, a number needed to treat of about 25 infants. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have long-term data beyond uh, 12 months published. Uh, at least I could not uh, find any um, subsequent publications from this study. So it, it is a, an interesting signal, but the long-term effect of prebiotics are, are not that clear. I also wanted to raise um, lactose in your awareness as a conditional prebiotic because um, there is a bit of a a negative perception of lactose in infant feeding because people perceive that it might cause diarrhea or might be difficult to digest, but lactose is the main ingredient, solid ingredient in breast milk, so it's there for a reason. So this is a study from Italy, um, which is also now uh, almost 10 years uh, old, which looked at 
uh, the comparison of microbiome in ba babies who were getting extensively hydrolyzed formula with and without lactose, and then again compared to breastfed infants. And what uh, this study showed that bifidobacteria and lactobacilli were significantly enhanced in the lactose containing EHF compared to the um, non lactose uh, product and bringing uh, the microbiome closer to that of breastfed infants. And you can see the increase in, if I uh, may say, good bacteria like bifidobacteria and lactobacilli and uh, a decrease in the later appearing uh, bacteria like Clostridium and um, Bacteroides. So a delay and maintenance of the healthy uh, bifido um, microbiome, which was also providing more short chain fatty acids. Highlighting really that lactose should be considered in the context of probiotics, prebiotics and HMOs. So what are HMOs? Very briefly, you are all familiar. Uh, it's the complex sugars that are in a way not for the nutrition of the baby, but for the nutrition of the microbiome. They feed up um, the bifidobacteria predominantly, so they are the host specific substrate for a healthy microbiome. And um, they are very important for immune function, gut barrier function, and even cognitive development. And it's for the past years that we have had access to a few of these HMOs um, uh, in breast milk identical form uh, via biofermentation uh, as novel ingredients in standard infant formula and more recently also in uh, hypoallergenic formulas. The effect of um, HMOs on the microbiome are very profound, as we know from breastfeeding. And um, when we now look at uh, standard infant formula supplemented with two HMOs, 2FL and LNMT, uh, this study um, could show that there was an increase uh, in bifidobacteria compared to unsupplemented formula closer to that, the level seen in breast milk and um, also a decrease in potentially pathogenic bacteria like Escherichia and Peptostreptococcus. And as you can see, the test formula or the um, uh, HMO supplemented formula takes an intermediate position between unsupplemented and breast milk. So it is a correction in the right way, but of course not reaching quite the effects that we see with breast milk. And um, this is also an interesting or important uh, graph because diversity in the first year of life is very low for breastfed infants. And this is something that is sometimes misunderstood. So we say that good, high diversity is good, but diversity should, uh, is reached later. And in the first year of life, high diversity is undesirable. And we want to keep the baby in this uh, low diversity bifido, high bifido state for longer. And you can see that the control unsupplemented formula progresses more towards an adult uh, diversity faster and that the test formula again significantly reduced this trend uh, by HMOs. So HMOs have an important microbiome uh, modifying effect and this is also evident now with the um, breast milk identical to HMOs that we have added to formulas. And this is from a clinical trial by Puccio which also showed that there are other benefits uh, in healthy infants fed a, a standard formula with uh, HMO supplementation with uh, two HMOs um, and you can see from zero to 12 months there was a uh, reduction in uh, bronchitis and lower respiratory tract infection and antibiotic use. Uh, so highlighting the important immune modulating effects of HMOs in the first year of life. And this is data that was presented um, recently at uh, the European Allergy Conference at Yaki uh, and uh, Ivan Van Ampla presented this uh, this is data from cow's milk allergic infants uh, receiving an extensively hydrolyzed formula supplemented with two HMOs. And you can see that uh, this study found this, a similar trend for lower respiratory tract infections, but for the first time also showed that the rate of upper respiratory tract infections per month, so the frequency of uh, upper respiratory tract infections in the first year of life was also significantly reduced by um, almost 50%. And this may have an important effect also on, uh, on the prevention of uh, allergic airway disease because we know that viral uh, upper respiratory tract infections um, may, may be a risk factor there. And um, finally, I wanted to just also show that HMOs directly interact with the gatekeepers of tolerance with dendritic cells. And you can see here 
on the um, right side, the um, T regulatory responses and IL-10, a tolerogenic um, messenger, uh, increasing with um, HMO uh, concentration. So this was an HMO dose dependent effect. So we need to be sp specific about the HMOs that are tested and of course about the dose. And we will probably will see now um, the uh, preventive effect for allergy prevention of HMOs being studied more closely and, and some of these studies are already ongoing and um, these results will probably appear uh, soon. So in summary, we, we, we all agree that uh, allergy risk is closely associated with disturbances in the early gut microbiome and that breastfeeding and delivery mode are probably the major modifiers of, of um, allergy risk with regard to the microbiome. Um, use of probiotics in pregnancy, breastfeeding, and directly uh, to the infants uh, has an important role still for the prevention of eczema, but seems to be less effective or ineffective for other allergic conditions, in particular, no effect on food allergy as far as we know. Um, supplementation with breast milk identical HMOs uh, reduces the incidence of respiratory infections and may also reduce allergy risk, but um, as I said, um, strong data uh, are not available at this stage. So what are the conclusions? Where is this going? So microbiome modifying therapies which target early gut dysbiosis are still important strategies to reduce allergy risk. And um, HMO supplementation may be emerging there as an important player um, in those who can't be breastfed. But I think we also have to uh, accept that we are looking at the combination of a range of pre preventive strategies um, to effectively hold the atopic march and also to prevent food allergies. And that's, this will be a combination um, of different interventions in the term of infant feeding, but also um, early allergen introduction and, uh, of course, um, the, the other major environmental uh, strategies. So we need further um, large trials, really, to prospectively assess these, uh, the effects of combined allergy prevention strategies uh, to, to really be evidence-based uh, going forward. So I leave it here uh, and look forward to your questions and I hope you um, found my perspective interesting. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hein, for a very uh, comprehensive review of the current scene in terms of the role of HMO uh, in relation uh, to changes in the microbiome as well as the subsequent risks of development of al uh, allergies. Um, May I kickstart one uh, important uh, aspect about how the different formulas with the HMO affect the microbiome? Because now you, you have shown us a lot of data that changes in the microbiomes are very important linked with the subsequent development of uh, various allergic conditions. And uh, we notice that in one of the slides that you present, the major determinant, as you mentioned, is how the babies were fed in the first few months. And the second biggest determinant appeared to be the geographic location, isn't it? And uh, could you shine some light on, you know, the importance of this, you know, what exactly is different in terms of a baby living in Australia versus a baby born and raised in Hong Kong <laughs> or someone born in Madrid now, probably that the kind of hygiene practice I hope in Madrid right now is very high. So how, how what exactly are the factors that influence the microbiome uh, in terms of the geographic variation? I think from, from my perspective, the, the biggest modifier, uh, apart from geographic uh, location, is, is feeding practices and diet. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is where we see differences, uh, duration of breastfeeding, um, and then also, I think, family structure, uh, number of siblings, um, uh, the type of housing, uh, crowded housing versus um, maybe more spacious uh, living. Uh, farm environment and so forth. I, I think um, geographic location probably summarizes many of um, mm -hmm. uh, different modifiers. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned um, feeding practices. So how soon do people start complementary feeding? Um, some, some stick very closely to the WHO guidelines. In Europe, we, we see that um, some countries introduce solids quite early. 
as part of their traditional way of uh, infant feeding. So I, I think around the world we see different feeding practices and different um, stringency in, in breastfeeding and uh, and also uh, use of elective cesarean section. So these are all um, modifiers. The um, the that you've uh, asked about the different types of um, formulas also on, on microbiome and, and I think there are obviously uh, geographic differences in the use of formulas. I think um, unsup HMO unsupplemented formula has um, uh, neglects the microbiome and I think uh, it will then um, the microbiome will then respond more for example to, to dietary fiber that come, comes in later. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some formulas, uh, for example, the, um, the uh, rice-based formula, which are not HMO supplemented, they don't have lactose. So, so I think all these um, uh, ingredients in the formulas will strongly determine how the microbiome is shaped up. And I think with lactose and HMOs, we have the best chance to get at least mm. close to what Mother Nature has intended. Right. And of course, with the changes in various guidelines around the world of suggesting early introductions of solids. And as we've learned from clinical trials, for example, like the EAT study, you know, early introduction for a variety of solids in a young baby between four to six months uh, could be difficult. And some parents could be more, maybe more successful than others. And also, as you mentioned, you know, depending on the cultural practice from place to place. You know, how would that interplay in terms of, you know, feeding and formula choices plus the type of early introduction practice? Where do we find a balance in how we should advise the parents when they're about to deliver the babies in terms of how they should be feeding the newborn? Uh, in anticipation to minimize the future risk of allergy? It's a very good, good question and um, no, probably not uh, easy to answer. Um, but um, from my perspective, and, and you mentioned um, the, uh, the EAT study, for example, where, where there were difficulties in introducing all the um, different food allergens uh, in, an, in, uh, in a timely fashion because infant-friendly formats for many of these foods are, are not available. And uh, if you have to provide a, a large number of allergens early on to the infant um, in, in a format that's not suitable for the developmental stage of the infant at four to six months, then that's difficult. And for parents, um, I think what the general guideline should be to progress to a diverse diet as early as possible. Um, but uh, to introduce all of the allergens early and maintain them regularly in the diet is a challenge, logistic challenge for parents. And perhaps industry can help in that direction. And um, you, you have probably already noticed that um, some uh, some industrial products or, or industry products are becoming available now that might assist uh, parents in introducing uh, mm -hmm. food allergens in, in a more organized and uh, baby-friendly format. Right. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Ralph, for a very enlightening talk. And, uh, and we will see you again next time. Thank you again for, for you, Garen, uh, speaking to us. Time. Yes. Right. And we'll move to, we'll have a very short break and then we'll start our next symposium thank you thank you goodbye thank you bye bye